we're going to be a little bit different today. Um, we've had somebody here in our presence that actually two people, they're going to depart us tomorrow. And it's two very, very, very special people uh, that are near and dear to my heart. They do a lot around here. Um, and they're just, they're very invaluable. And um, that's Jeff and Cheryl sitting back there, Jeff and Cheryl Cook. Um, they're heading out tomorrow. Normally they're snowbirds, so they're here in the winter time, but with enough coaxing and begging and pleading, uh, they agreed to stay this past year, and Jeff's been doing um, all of our maintenance. He uh, pretty much himself alone painted both buildings over on the north campus over there, did a phenomenal job, and, and we, we would stand back, we'd look at him, we're like, nah, let's flip those colors. And he's like, okay, and we just repaint things. And so there's like 87 coats of paint on that building now. Um, probably not quite that bad. Um, but I, I know Jeff pretty well, and we, we talk, he comes up to my office, and we chit-chat here and there. Um, and Jeff has quite a story. Um, Jeff is one of those people that you can definitely look at and say, Jesus has changed this man greatly, greatly. And I know some of you guys, and really technically all of us, but some of us really have that story where Jesus came in and, and he did something amazing. And, and Jeff has said to me a few times, hey, if you would ever like, I would be happy to give my testimony in front of the church. And I, I know how powerful testimonies are, so... Um, I kind of sprung it on him as I was thinking through after Mother's Day last week. What am I going to do this week? Am I going to get back into Heroes and Zeros, or do I want to do something a little different? And I said, you know what? Let's ask Jeff to come up and talk about his testimony and what Jesus has done in his life. So would you please give a big, warm welcome to Jeff? If you don't know Jeff, you've got less than 24 hours, so, and I would highly suggest maybe somebody take him out to lunch today, so, how's that? Yeah, you like that? I thought you might like that. Hello? Oh, now it's working. As uh, Trevor said, my name's Jeff Cook. Some people might know me as Daryl, my other brother Daryl's back in the sound booth. Uh, it goes back from a couple years ago when we were doing uh, uh, connections. You know, this looks different from this side, Trevor. I see all these people with smiling faces. I know everybody from the back of their head back there. I can go in public and say, I know that person. I see the back of his head every Sunday. That's pretty cool. Uh, but when I told Pastor I'd do my, uh, my testimony, I, I didn't think he'd take me serious. But uh, I'd like to share with you uh, the transformation that took part in my life. Uh, when I was young, as a kid, we lived in Sarasota for a while. And uh, I didn't grow up in a church family. But my brothers and I went to a small Baptist church in Sarasota. My dad said, church is for sinners and you guys need to be at church but my dad didn't go to church I thought that was kind of strange well during during the services we'd see people go up front and they would go up and then they're kind of like this there was a baptismal back there they get their robes and they get baptized we'd talk, oh that is so cool let's do that so one week uh the uh the pastor had to, and on all recall, and everybody says, let's go, let's go. So we stormed up front, and the pastor said, do you know what you're doing here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we know what this is all about. So we got in the robes, and we got up front, and we got baptized. So that being said, I went through life thinking, it's all good. I got checked off. I've been baptized. Now, this is the rest of the story. Time moves on, and uh, I now live in New York. And uh, does anybody remember the movie Stay Alive, John Travolta? You know, best movie ever, right? Well, in the opening scene of that movie, John Travolta struck down the street. He is it. Well, 
when I was growing up, that was me. I was in charge and so full of myself it wasn't even funny. Well, and I lived a life of things that I thought, did things I thought were fun, cool, acceptable to society, and some things that weren't so acceptable to society. I like to party. Beer was my friend. And too many times, it was probably my best friend. And uh, I was usually the life of the party. I, uh, I like to make people laugh. I love the attention. So that was me. I uh, usually was the first to the first to be at a party. And I was usually the last to leave. And who knows, sometimes maybe even Mary J would show up at those parties. And also getting in. You know, staying late, somebody had to help get rid of the beer. So I sacrificed. You know, I did grow up in the 70s, so you know, you understand how that's like. All in all, I'd say through my youth, my young adult, and even not so young adult years, I'd be considered a punk. I was, like I said, I was very full of myself. I met my wife, Cheryl. When she was, well, I was 16. She was a little bit younger than me. Uh, and I chased her through school, all the way through high school, until, uh, I guess you'd say I just wore her down. And uh, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. And so we got married in uh, 1972. Well, not very long afterwards. We had our son, Adam, and a very short time after that, we had my daughter, Tamara. They were 11 months apart. Don't judge me. All right. So you'd think at that time with having a wife, two very young children, and we did own a house. We weren't married very long, but we had bought a house, uh, that I would have maybe accepted some... Uh, some responsibility, not so much. Uh, I did what I wanted to do, pretty much what I wanted to do it. I put most of the parenting of our children on my wife's shoulders. She did a phenomenal job of it. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, I wasn't totally a deadbeat. I worked hard. I worked two jobs at times, I did whatever I needed to do to make ends meet. And then later on through different jobs, I, I uh, started working for Epsa Cole in Jamestown, New York. Uh, got into management and became married to my job. I spent an enormous amount of time at my job. I thought that's how you got ahead. You had to pay your dues. Spend the time, do what you needed to do to get ahead. Well. Along with the time I spent at work, I had other things I needed to do. I mean, after all, I had to uh, had to bowl. I bowled in a league. I played uh, softball in a couple of different leagues at different times. I golfed. I hunted and fished whenever I wanted to. Uh, occasionally, you have to have a night out with the guys. You know, that's always productive. Um, I was a volunteer fireman. And if anybody knows volunteer firemen, they party. They do a phenomenal service, but that was a couple nights a week also. And all the time I'm doing all of these fun things that I enjoy doing, my precious wife stayed home and took care of our kids. You can see there's a pattern that uh, kind of was taking place here. Uh, I wasn't a very devoted family man. Well, while still living in, in, in New York, uh, Cheryl convinced me to start going to church regularly. So we attended uh, St. Timothy Lutheran Church, a small uh, Lutheran church in Bemis Point, New York. It's a church we got married in. And uh, actually, Cheryl was a charter member of that church. I think they started in the fire hall, maybe, or the library, and grew 
grew up in, into a pretty decent church. So I started going to the church uh, there, changed some of my wayward ways, some of my wayward ways, um, and got quite involved. I had something in common with the pastor. He had worked in the beverage industry for a number of years before he became a pastor. So we shared stories there. After time, I got involved in a number of different things. I was part of committees, uh, volunteered to be assistant liturgist, and eventually ended up being the chairman of the church council. Um, and at that point, I thought, I have arrived. I am a religious man. I mean, what the heck? How could I not be religious? I went to church every Sunday. I volunteered. I did different things. I was the chairman of the, the, uh, the church council. I was overseeing a major building project that was going on. We were in the process of expanding the church. So I thought, this is pretty good. Now, that all may look good on a resume, but there was something that was dramatically missing. That's right. I had no relationship with Jesus Christ. I went through the motions, I played the role, and I was the proverbial hypocrite. The people, the kind of people that non-church goers say, I don't want to go because of you. I was that person that gave church a bad name, really. I thought I was doing a great thing, but it wasn't even close. Um, so as time went on, we ended up uh, making some changes. I changed jobs. We left uh, uh, left New York. I worked for, uh, uh, well, first I, you know, I'd say I worked for Pepsi for almost 15 years. I switched brands, went to Coca-Cola, and uh, we moved to Meadville, Pennsylvania. Good change, too, let me tell you. And I like Coke better. Um, we moved to Meadville, Pennsylvania, where I ran a Coke plant for uh, about a year. And... It wasn't me. I ended up changing jobs again, still with Coca-Cola, but I went to Erie, Pennsylvania, where I worked at Coca-Cola. And there again, uh, being married to my job, and when I lived in Meadville and worked in Erie, it was 42, 45 miles each way to work. So I spent a lot of time on the road just getting back and forth to work. And uh, during all of this time, I figured I'd probably broken most of the Ten Commandments. I was, in simple terms, a miserable SOB that put himself in front of just about everything else. If there was nothing in it for me, I didn't usually do it. And that's the way I looked at it. There's got to be something in it for me. And, uh, well, we moved to, we ended up moving down to Kentucky. I transferred with Coke and ended up running the distribution department of Coca-Cola. And uh, after time, I ended up retiring with over 30 years in the beverage industry. Um, we moved to Kentucky, and we started attending a small church in Versailles, Kentucky. Cheryl's sister said, you ought to join this church. She had moved down there, too. And so we started going to this, uh, at the time it was Woodford Community Christian Church. And the first time I went, I was impressed with the music of all things. It was modern music, great, and a great worship brand. Uh, and I like that modern music. It wasn't the traditional uh, hymns. Although there's, I, I love some some of those great hymns, you know. I'll take that, that old rugged cross any day. Uh, but all this time, something was missing. I felt uh, my marriage was in trouble, and I was not on a good path. I was going to this church, and uh, one Sunday, the uh, youth pastor, uh, Dave Menser, uh, who I liked, got to know through the church, and I, I, I loved to listen to him 
speak. He had Southern Baptist roots. He kind of got up on a stump once in a while. I just liked that preaching. He was captivating, right? Well, he's uh, he's preaching about the different plagues that were sent uh, down to down to Pharaoh. And uh, this one play is uh, about the the frogs. And it says in Exodus 8, 9, 10, uh, Moses told Pharaoh he would leave the honor of setting the time when he would pay to remove the frogs up to him. Now remember, at this time, I had very little Bible knowledge. I went to church and played, played a role in that. But, Something overcame me at that point, and I said out loud, we sat in the second row, and I said out loud, tomorrow, he's going to say tomorrow. But I said it out loud. Now, you all know probably what the answer was, or is. And Dave said, yes, and looked at me and said, tomorrow. I'm blown. It's like, how could that be? You know, and at that point, I had all kinds of things running through my brain, and I, I just thought to myself, "Wait a minute! How can I ever be good enough? And how can I ever be right with God to accept Him? I, my life is just too messed up to have a relationship with Christ. It just couldn't happen." So. Pastor goes on, and uh, he starts telling a story about uh, a flock of ducks. So the ducks all waddle off to church, and they're sitting in the, in the pews. And the, the pastor duck gets up, and he starts preaching. And he starts telling, he says, you guys have the equipment to soar like eagles. You have wings. You can fly. You do not have to waddle around all your life. You have the tools to be great. And the ducks all cheered and got all excited. And he says, now go out and conquer the world. Yeah, they all cheered. And they went out. And they walked home. Are you kidding me? Right then, I felt David Menser was looking right into my heart and preaching to me. My only thought at that point was, I am not walking home, and there may not be a tomorrow. I started uncontrollably sobbing. I was so broken. And uh, the, the pastor called, had an elder call, and I couldn't wait to the point where he was done, and I just, I pushed the chairs apart in front of me. And walked up front and I was crying like a baby and David looked at me and he looked over at Pastor Randy and he says you need to come and help me on this one and Randy came over and he talked to me and he said he said Jeff would you like me to baptize you now remember as a kid I was baptized I was checked off no I don't need to be baptized but I need to commit my life to Christ so we talked and you know several weeks after that I met with Randy. We talked with different things. But that's when my life really started to change. I quit drinking. Didn't miss the headaches at all. And I remembered things. I remember lots of things. I felt a kind of peace coming over me that I hadn't felt before. I didn't feel condemned and I felt like I had a purpose. I changed from the inside. Our church was setting up a mission trip to Mexico. And I told my wife, I said, I can do that. I'm handy. I can build things. We're going to build a house for a needy, needy family. I said, okay, I'm going to do that. So I volunteered to go on this mission trip. Well, I thought, you know, before that time, if anybody asked me, or said to me, you're going to spend about $1,000 of your money. You're going to give up a 
week of your vacation, and you're going to go to Mexico, Juarez, on top of that at the time was the drunk capital of the world, and all kinds of uh, bad things were happening in Juarez, and go down there and build a house for somebody you don't even know, and be glad with it. Maybe not so much. But I did it. And it was uh, it was very, very rewarding. It was more a blessing to me than it was to uh, the lady who built the house for me. Um, during the, the build in the morning we would uh, we would pray before we got started. Duncan Gardner, who was the, uh, the guy that kind of coordinated the, the trip to the, to the church, asked if anybody would volunteer to pray before we got started. And it seemed like forever and nobody said anything. And I'm like, what's going on? Nobody's going to pray. I'll do it. So I did. I prayed for the, uh, for the group to get started in one thing or another. But halfway through this prayer, I started crying. I just was overcome with emotion. I figured out, like, what? what this? This is not, this isn't right. This is not me. So we go on a couple days later. We're at the end of our build, and we are going to dedicate the home and give the keys to the homeowner. And uh, Duncan came up to me and said, let me back up a minute. I told Duncan prior to this, I had never prayed in public. I just didn't know how. I, wasn't, I just didn't do it. So that was a first. And then he said, uh, would you like to present the keys to Alejandro? I said, it'd be honored. So uh, to the ceremony, you know, we had their pastor was there and had a you know, regular ceremony. So I you know, made a presentation on behalf of our church and the people here, and blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, I'm crying again. I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? So uh, I just I, did, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. As time goes on, I went twice more to Mexico. Same thing. Went down to Juarez. The last time was... Uh, very, very sketchy. There was a, almost a point where we canceled the trip because of all the violence that was at the border. All of the, the cartel was killing Americans. And we decided to go and figure that, you know, the Lord was going to be with us and it was going to work. And it did. And I also uh, went on a trip to Haiti. And that's another eye awakener. Um, all this time, I struggled with the fact that God had forgiven me and that I was worthy of his grace. I thought, I kept thinking, how can that be? I have done so many bad things. How can I be forgiven and God you know, forgive me like that? Well, it came to the point where uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. I realized and accepted that and my life started to move in amazing ways. I finally knew what redemption was and that only by God's grace I had been saved. And at that point I could say, I now have a relationship with Jesus. A true relationship. Now, I came very involved with the church after that. I was very, very involved. I was rebaptized, and uh, I knew why. I knew what I was doing. Uh, I led uh, uh, small groups. I was in a couple of different small groups. I was part of a mentorship uh, program with my pastor. I became a deacon. I became chairman of the mission committees. I was on the building and grounds committee. Uh, in fact, I think I painted the entire inside of that church. And as Trevor said, I do a little bit of 
meeting around here. <laughs> A lot of meeting around here. Uh, Pastor Randy asked me one time, he said, would you be willing to share your testimony? I don't like this. I said, yeah, I'd be glad to. Well, we did two services at the time. And between services, I got this uncanny feeling, something, I don't know what, just came over me that, you know, we've been married for a lot of years at that point, and I put Cheryl through a lot of miserable things because of my selfishness, one thing or another, and I thought, how cool would it be to get remarried and have Christ as the forefront of our marriage? So I told Randy, I want to ask Cheryl to... Uh, Renew our vows and remarry me. He goes, oh, he says, are you sure? <laughs> and she, but she, what if she says no? <laughs> oh, don't say that, Randy. I, uh, I said, I'm going to take the chance. So, after my testimony, I said, uh, Cheryl, can you come up front a minute? Oh, God. So, <laughs> My buddy helps her up front. I'm just so sitting up here. I said, uh, "Buddy, I'd like to ask you to do me a huge honor and remarry me with Christ leading the way." She said, "Yes." This July we celebrate 50 years. December is 10 years of renewing of her vows. How blessed am I? How blessed am I to have that woman? Now, I'm not perfect by any means, by any means at all. You ask Cheryl, she'll tell you. But, but if you also ask Cheryl, I think she would undoubtedly say she likes the latter Jeff a lot better than she did the old Jeff. In fact, if you'd ask me, I like me a whole lot better than the old Jeff. <laughs> you know, serving in a church, both like the one I served back, back in Kentucky, and serving in this church, Serving a community is such a blessing. Not only once do you serve, but also to yourself. Belonging to a community of fellow believers, Christians that share the same values, love one another, and love God is an awesome thing. Our son passed away nine years ago this November. Obviously, you know, we were devastated. But in no time did we ever lose our faith in God. And I don't know how we would have survived without our faith and our church family. Our church family stepped up from the moment Adam passed. I still don't know to this day how he did it. The pastor was preaching in between services. Uh, we got the news about Adam. We took off and went to the house. Owner when it was still there, and he had no longer seen. I mean, it wasn't just a few minutes after after twelve, and I look up and Randy was pulling in the driveway. I don't, I don't even know how he knew where we were, where we were, but from that point, uh, our church family provided spiritual strength, prayer, lots of prayer. They provided meals. They provided provided housing for a lot of the family that we had come in from out of town for the funeral. Uh, it was they, they helped with expenses for the funeral. Adam did have insurance. Uh, they helped with everything, and it wasn't just for a few days. They were there for us always. This church has been no different. When we got COVID, 
church, you know, I both went home at the same time. This church was there, along with not just the body of this church in prayer, but our small group that uh, we have the honor of belonging to this past year, um, provided meals and groceries, and we knew if we needed anything, phone call or text, and it was taken care of. Cheryl had a uh, hard time breathing one night. We called the ambulance to the, to the trailer. As many of you know, she had massive blood clots in her heart. And they rushed her off to Miami to the hospital. And uh, she had to go through emergency procedure to, re to replace those. And uh, so many times the doctor said, we can't believe you're alive. People don't live through this. This, is, this was major. But there again, from the moment we found out and left, the pastor was in contact with me. Other people in this church were in contact. We spent two weeks. Uh, she had to be hospitalized for two weeks. Uh, this church made arrangements for me to stay at the hospital in Miami, right next to the hospital, so I could be with her. And. They've just been, they've been here for me, for us, in so many ways throughout the time that we've been here. We've been coming down here now for like six years, and this past year has been, been very, very special because there wasn't a break in between. We were, we weren't snowbirds this year. We were, we were Keys people. We, we lived here, and uh, we're actually, uh, we're sad to leave, but we are coming back. Uh, through all this, I can definitely say that Pastor Trevor looks after his flock. He is, he is sold out to this, this church and this body. It's such a blessing to be able to call him a friend, not just a pastor, but friend. We need each other. And don't be afraid to ever lean on your church family. You know, I've served in my church in Kentucky and I've served at this church for, for many years now, offer my talents and services, and I look forward to being able to do it for many more years. Bottom line is we serve a forgiving, loving God who is full of grace. I'm so glad that God never gave up on me. And I'm even more glad that Cheryl didn't give up on me. God has a plan for us and all we have to do is be willing to listen. Don't be like I did. Don't wait till you're halfway through your life or three quarters through your life before you make a decision to follow Christ. The biggest benefit I have through all of this is knowing I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I think of all the goodness of life that I may have missed in my selfish years when I was off doing my thing, following my needs instead of following Christ. Don't wait to make that decision. Make it today to follow Jesus. I'm telling you, you won't regret it. Will you pray with me? Most gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you today a humble, humble person. I can't thank you enough for the grace that you have poured out of my life, the people that you have put in my life, and most importantly, what you did on the cross sacrificing your son for our sins that someday we can all be together with you in heaven. But I just ask now that you would be with this body, be with this church as we move forward. Just have them see that there is, there is such a, such a great life that can be lived if we just 
open our hearts, listen to what the Lord is telling us, and follow him. Father, I love you, and ask all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. You heard what he said, right? He said they're coming back next year. I think the thing that really gripped me and the thing that is so central to my messages when I'm preaching is that it is not head knowledge of Jesus. It is not a transaction that happens in here. Oh, I know some stuff about Jesus. It's the transaction that happens in here in our hearts. And he said, it all happened when I decided to have a relationship with Jesus. That's it. It's, it's not doing some stuff. It's not church attendance. It's not baptism. It's not your grandma's faith. It's none of those things. It's a true relationship with Jesus to where you wake up every day and some days are better than others but every day we look at it and say God you are in charge of my life what is it that you want me to do and man that, sometimes I fail at that but that's why there's grace just like he spoke about I'm so thankful for God's grace so would you bow your heads one more time I just want to give you an opportunity this morning if you maybe have some head knowledge, you maybe have been to church all of your life, but you've never really made that commitment to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Would you right now today in this moment say, Jesus, I make you my true Lord and Savior. Jesus, that I, I believe today with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my being that you died for Jesus, that you take broken pieces like me and turn them into masterpieces. Jesus, save me. Jesus, change me. I give you my life. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out or anything. Would you just slip your hand up? So I can celebrate with you that you have made that decision today, that you today have decided to give your life to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Jesus, we're so grateful for you. We're so grateful that you changed lives, that you didn't just come to clean us up a little bit and brush off the dust. God, you came to wash us Thank you, God, that you sent Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice for us, to make a way for us to spend eternity with you. And as we come in this time of offering, God, would you be honored by what we give? God, that we wouldn't give out of guilt or compulsion, but God, we would give so that we would see your gospel taken into this community and in this world. God, help us to be wise. Help us to use this offering in a way that it makes a difference in things that are going to matter in a thousand years. We pray all of this in your awesome and amazing name.